Hello, everyone, and welcome to BBA's webinar on Industrial Control System Cybersecurity Risk Methodology. My name is Sahar Paksat, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Advisor at BBA. Today's speakers are Jose Alvarado, the ICS Cybersecurity Department Manager at BBA, and Paul Hockey, an Automation and ICS Cybersecurity Specialist at BBA. Both are based in Calgary. This webinar presentation will be about 45 minutes long and we will have time for some questions as well. But first I'd like to give you some background about today's presentation. BBA receives funding from Natural Resources Canada's Cybersecurity and Critical Energy Infrastructure Program to develop a risk methodology for industrial control system environments. By establishing a methodology that helps identify and evaluate ICS cyber risks, we provide a supplement for companies to use, in addition to established methodologies that help control cyber risks of enterprise IT environments. This will assist companies with better visibility, awareness, and protection on rising cyber risks that are threatening their operational environment. This webinar will go over some industry examples of ICS cyber risk assessments. Also, the cyber risk methodology um, report is available to download from our website at bba.ca. And you can find it here in the webinars handout section by clicking on the document shaped icon on the left side of your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them in the chat box on the left side of your screen. You just click on the little bubble icon. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Jose Alvarado is BBA's ICS Cybersecurity Department Manager. He has extensive experience in several engineering fields, in particular with renewable power generation control projects and integrating industrial IP networks and SCADA systems. He also participated in upgrading control and telecommunication systems, including design, technical specifications, and commissioning within the scope of several utility and oil and gas projects. Currently, he leads BBA's Industry 4.0 Cybersecurity Initiative within our ICS Cybersecurity Group. Our second speaker is Paul Hockey, BBA's Automation and ICS Cybersecurity Specialist. Paul has over 35 years of experience specializing in industrial control system design and in programming and commissioning a variety of systems. He has worked on projects in the oil and gas, manufacturing, power utility, pipeline, oil sands, wastewater treatment, and food and beverage sectors. Paul has led several cybersecurity projects, assisting clients in meeting NERC CIP regulatory requirements, developing incidents response plans, performing assessments, and gap analyses. He has also built custom automation solutions using embedded controllers and IoT platforms. And he also established two automation companies over the past 15 years. Welcome to you both. Glad to have you present this important topic. I will now pass it over to you, Jose. Thank you, Sahar. Welcome to this ICS Cyber Risk Pathology webinar. So uh, today uh, in our presentation, so we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, how we develop the ICS risk methodology. Uh, we're gonna provide, as uh, Sahar mentioned, some examples, and we're gonna be working on, also on some of the concepts of the frameworks on the standard. So Paul, maybe you can pass to the next slide now, the introduction section. So people have asked us why to complete the risk methodology when so much information is already available. It's a good question. However, the reason why we do this is because clients were asking for a simplified methodology, one that will be adapted to their industrial control systems. And this is to be able to identify unique challenges encountered in the operational environment. So this document was created in a, in a way actually leveraging a collection of standards and guidelines that are already available and best practices from IT and operations. ICS cyber risk, as we know, 
uh, to identify then this is still new it's something that we're we're now just n learning and knowing how to do it so we need to start integrating and establishing new practices that are more ICS cyber risk oriented and that's the main idea about this risk methodology it's a very um, oriented ICS oriented methodology now a little bit about BBA we are a consulting company working in the mining, utilities, and oil and gas sectors, a privately owned Canadian company, 40 years uh, since it was established, with offices across Canada and the US. And we are a high specialized firm providing services in industrial IT, cybersecurity for ICS environments, advanced control, electrical automation, environmental, carbon capture, mechanical, civil, digital transformation it's a company of around 1000 employees and we are more than happy to be providing this webinar to to you people now a little bit more about the ics cyber risk methodology as sahar mentioned so this is funded uh, from natural resource canada program that was created uh, two years ago and this project actually was uh, executed last year and this year so the ICS risk methodology, as also Sahar mentions, is available in our website. But I, something I'd like to mention here, so what was the approach that we took for developing this methodology? And as we mentioned, so we leveraged information available in IT and operational environments. So we did not reinvent the wheel, but we took existing risk methodologies and we adapted them. So we didn't start from scratch. And those methods are integrating a specific ICS cyber requirements. And with this, when I jump into our first question that was asked uh, in one of these surveys, so what's the state of the risk assessment? And uh, the question was actually asked to 370 industrial organizations. So have you ever done an OT risk assessment? The results were not surprising. 74% have not done an, a risk assessment in ICS or OT environments, but neither did, did they know if uh, it was already completed. So we still have a lot of work to do here, even though, even though we have seen also an increase in awareness, but still uh, a place to growth. But the justification, I will say, is much easier now for this type of assessment. And we need to compare. If we compare against uh, assessments being done in other areas of the company, like IT or even operation itself, uh, so ICS risk cybersecurity assessments are not there yet. With this, I'm going to jump into another important topic. So evaluating risk and specifically risk management. So we always look into these two concepts of impacts and likelihood. And this is a, a graphic may not be able to see very well, but uh, I, I can tell you that this is just a, a, a graphic coming from the World Economic Forum last year, back in January, just before the pandemic. And I, I'm gonna bring that example. I know we don't wanna talk again about the pandemic, but uh, it's it's very actually very pertinent to, to bring it up. So infectious disease was categorized or classified as an event with a high impact. However, the likelihood of that event happening was very low. And why I'm bringing this? Because it's very similar to cybersecurity. Were we prepared for this? We definitely were not prepared. Can we do better? Yes, we can do better. So we have been living in this pandemic now for more than a year, and we now recognize the big impact that this pandemic has had in, in our life. In cybersecurity, it's, like I mentioned, is similar. So even though some of these ICS cybersecurity events may not happen or very difficult for, for a company to, to have a problem like that, so that doesn't mean you won't, you won't be prepared. 
that doesn't mean you 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 don't have to actually wait till something happened to to do something or react or even work in an ad hoc matter. I, I'm going to bring you another example, September 11. So when the terrorist attack happened in September in September 11, so some of the companies that actually they disappeared completely from from this, the the market, and the reason was. They didn't have recovery plans, they didn't have a response, so they were just running one single operation from one single location. So even though uh, September 11 event was not a cyber attack, you, you could relate to, to some of the activities or responses that you, you're going to put in place for something like that it will benefit uh, a response in, in regards to cybersecurity events as well. So that's just as an example that I wanted to bring up to the table now. The next uh, slide, so it's the challenge. So the challenge we found, so with all those uh, different different guidelines and, and different risks that you can find in IT and also in the operational environment. So the, the, the challenge was how to put together something that will bring those elements that you, that you find in IT and also in, in operations, so in engineering environments. And the reality is that uh, our our methodology creates establish that link between operations on one side, where methodologies are oriented to secure people and machines, and on the other side, the risk identification guidelines are used and well mature in the IT environment. So we establish a kind of a link between these two areas. Uh, they are they are exactly what we want to be talking about here: the ICS cybersecurity risk. So we're going to pass into the next slide, which is another question that, that was asked last year. This is coming from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies in the States, an association that actually covers uh, all big, large, publicly owned water utility companies. And the question was here, which cyber threats are the highest priority for your organization in the next 12 months? And as not surprise, ransomware, denial of service, and phishing were among the top priorities in our organization. IT-oriented type of events. However, when we talk about ICS and operations, we're still behind these IT-oriented events. Again, there's some awareness already done, but that doesn't mean uh, we have progress uh, as we want. And I encourage people just to have, you know, conversations about these risks that you can find in the operational level. So having those, you know, coffee or, or virtual uh, coffee conversation with your uh, people that, you know, from other departments within the organization. They need to know that uh, there is an issue that can be also very difficult and negative uh, for the company if, if that happened to materialize. So I will just, again, encourage people to have those conversations with your uh, colleagues and uh, they're actually working in, in finance or, or even IT or, or security. So they will be able to, to, to see it from you if you actually bring it up to them. Okay, uh, now uh, frameworks and standards and guidelines that we use. As, as you notice, uh, there are many standards and frameworks available. One of them, NERC, is a uh, electric industry standard, very well mature, established in 2009. But uh, we also leverage other standards. Among the most common ones are the ISO 27000 standards, the IC 62443, very um, ICS oriented, and then NIST. Again, we didn't reinvent anything, but uh, we established uh, you know, good actually uh, guideline by leveraging information from these different references and standards that we we found available now. Now talking about how we position ICS cybersecurity within an organization. So you see there. Uh, we have three levels of the organization. So, so the level one is more kind of the corporate, and then level two, business processes, and level three, operational. That's where that's where we are located. So ICS, cybersecurity, 
is done along uh, industrial IT or OT devices. So we, we're going to look for protecting those systems and also put uh, policies and, and processes and systems and technology in place for detecting and also uh, activities for responding to as, such as uh, cybersecurity events. This cybersecurity is very tactical, but we have to make sure those systems are actually and, and those uh, risk components that we put in place are related to other other uh, departments in the corporation. So people that are looking after the safety of the financial or the security. So we cannot identify this risk uh, in an isolated way. We have to make sure we make that connection with other areas of the corporation. And this is pretty much what I, I want to bring this uh, topic to, to you. And um, uh, again, feeling that uh, process safety uh, can impact also uh, many part of the cooperation as well. Now the framework that we put together is composed by the three major areas, so assess, respond, and monitor. The purpose of the risk assessment component, which is the one that we're gonna be developing a little bit more during this presentation, so is to identify assets, their classification, and their interdependency. So threats to organizations uh, or threats directly through organizations against other uh, organizations or nation. So we're going to be looking to review that. And on in regards to the response, so uh, the purpose of the risk response component is to provide a consistent organization-wide response to risk in accordance with the risk framework by developing alternative course of, of actions. And the third component not the less important, um, the monitor component. So the risk monitoring component, uh, the main purpose is to determine the ongoing effectiveness of risk responses. So the controls that have to be checked. And, and as I mentioned uh, in the past, when I was talking to colleagues, so this is a continuous process. So it's not true that cybersecurity is gonna be able to, to be done um, you know, one or, or two times. You have to, have a continuous process of assessment, responding, and monitoring uh, those controls that you put in place. On my final slide before passing to Paul, so just give an introduction again on the risk assessment portion of this methodology that we have put in place. Uh, it's gonna be more about risk, the risk model. As you see, there are many risk factors and their relationships. So typical risk factors include uh, vulnerabilities, threats, impacts, and likelihood. So this relationship between all risk factors indicates organization's risk. So Paul will be providing more practical examples of the risk models and the risk factors that we have reviewed here. And if you wanna see more details about other part of this uh, methodology that we created, so assessment approach, analysis approach, uh, we invite you to review it in the document that we put together uh, for, for Natural Resource Canada, which is available in our website. With this, I'm gonna pass now the word to my colleague, Paul Hockey. Thank you, Jose. The next group of slides, uh, we're gonna look at the approach uh, to risk assessment. And that will include assess, assets, threats, controls, vulnerability, likelihood, and followed by impact. So when we talk about assets, um, we want to identify those assets that are critical to the business. Although uh, identifying and classifying assets looks like a very simple thing to do, uh, in reality, it is, it is usually one of the largest areas where we see gaps. Uh, clients have sometimes thousands of industrial assets spread ac across large geographical areas. Uh, sometimes there's confusion on what is a, a bulk electric system asset in the utility industry. Other operators have added assets through mergers and acquisitions, and unfortunately, the inventory list didn't come along with it. Uh, so, so these devices that we're talking about were devices that were uh, put in service perhaps 20 years ago, and they were never designed to withstand some of the cyber attacks that we see today. So there are some automated tools available for asset discovery. 
uh, not yet widely uh, used, but um, these tools have sometimes difficulty uh, communicating with some older ICS assets, uh, such like uh, such as pr protection relays, uh, but the tools are getting much better. Uh, so the message here is to identify your ICS assets that are critical to your business. You got to know what to protect. The next area will be threat. So there are a lot of uh, products, references, and tools available that can be used to identify and evaluate ICS threats. And, and some of these are um, ICS CERT, uh, Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, uh, MITRE ATT&CK for ICS, they're all good uh, references. Uh, MITRE is a knowledge base that's useful for describing the actions that an adversary might take while within your ICS network. And the knowledge that can be gained here uh, is a good understanding of the adversary's behavior. And this allows uh, an organization to prioritize. You know, another tool that we, we have come across is the bow tie diagram, and that's used to assess risk. And we'll review that in, uh, in some uh, detail upcoming here. So controls, uh, an example of security control for your house might be something like a security system sign on your lawn, a security camera, uh, an alarm system, or even a dog. So controls you know, should be monitored for effectiveness because uh, for new threats, in my neighborhood last year, for example, someone was able to break into the neighbor's garage at night by sniffing the frequency from their garage door opener. So a compensating control in this scenario might be to power off your garage door at night. And the tendency is for security controls to potentially degrade in effectiveness over time. And, and this reinforces the need to maintain at assessments during the entire life cycle uh, of the operations. As, as the risk assessments are updated and refined, Organizations can use risk assessment, assessments and monitoring results uh, to update their management strategy, to improve responses to risks that are tailored for the operational functions. Next, we talk about vulnerabilities. Uh, same Bluer research uh, identified that 78% of companies do not have an OT-specific cybersecurity policy and 81% of companies do not have an OT-specific uh, cyber incident response plan. So traditionally, vulnerability management um, in ICS may not you know, matter as much as IT. For example, patching can only occur during an outage, which might occur every year or even longer. So the vulnerabilities are constantly changing. Uh, new vulnerabilities appearing all the time. We need to prioritize the vulnerabilities. And it might not make sense uh, to patch equipment in the field if, for example, the backups aren't even done properly or on a regular basis, if USB sticks are still being used to transfer information, or uh, if no controls are in place for vendor remote access or, or missing uh, incident response plans. So um, one example of um, uh, back in the uh, fires in uh, Fort McMurray five years ago, we had a large client that was uh, an operator that was uh, doing backups as they were actually evacuating a facility. Uh, they did not just, you know, anticipate uh, the need to evacuate the facility and it was never really top priority. But uh, this, the good news is that this helped them test their uh, disaster recovery plan on, on a live event and um, they had some learnings out of that uh, situation. So you never know where, where you're going to need to perform a, a task that was never really planned for. So when it comes to likelihood, um, it's just not uh, that, like uh, Jose had mentioned, it's, not, it's just because the event has not happened in the past doesn't mean that it's going to not happen in the future. And examples are, of course, the pandemic he talked about, but also the solar winds attack from last year. You know, these events have not occurred before, but when they do occur, they have a potentially devastating impact. Um, so if you're looking at uh, evaluating likelihood and you're having some challenges, uh, determining the likelihood. You can look at uh, tools like Dread Model for scoring vulnerabilities, but use whatever method your organization is comfortable with. Uh, you know, you can reduce likelihood uh, also by uh, achieving uh, through equipment redundancy. Uh, but other things to consider when looking at likelihood would be the frequency of exploiting the attempt, uh, frequency of incidents, the complexity of exploiting vulnerabilities and the vulnerability severity and exposure level that's often um, should be looked at. 
and we're going to wrap up the uh, uh, list here with uh, impact. Now, once again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but if we have, uh, if your organization is already uh, doing process hazards analysis and you've got some uh, data available on the impact, it might make sense to use this data that's already available. The key is to include impacts such as interruption of service, plant shutdowns, environmental impacts, or loss of life. Risk, risk evaluation looks at, at different scenarios and, and potentials and, and impacts. So two common areas are qualitative and quantitative analysis. So the quantitative risk analysis is not as common uh, due to the lack of data with um, OTIC, ICS cybersecurity. Uh, the qualitative risk analysis is, is a much simpler evaluation. It's used to quickly identify uh, and manage your risks uh, be before they exceed a certain threshold. So it's not used for a basis of a comprehensive risk management program, but the quantitative risk analysis is, is really more exhaustive examination using numeric values. So this is the bow tie model. This is uh, used for risk assessments. And, and the way this works, if you look on the left-hand side, you have in blue the threats. On the right-hand side, you have in orange the um, the impacts uh, might be a bit washed out for you, but uh, the intent is uh, you have uh, on the left uh, the different various colored controls that are used to either uh, prevent, slow down an attacker. Uh, you can't really keep somebody out. You can only delay them or, or try to uh, make it more difficult for them. And, and the different color will be an indicator of the effectiveness of the control. So if the control is in place and it's uh, operating efficiently, it's in the green. Uh, for example, if we have a uh, physical security that uh, has some gaps in, in the control that might be shown in, in yellow and a, a control that's shown in red will be essentially not not effective. Uh, so um, on the left hand side we want to try to keep the threat out and if, if they get past all of those uh, controls and then they hit the, the center and that's the the actual attack they've landed in your network they've on your they're on your your HMI system. So now the uh, you know the the cows are out of the barn. So so now we want to mitigate that uh, that that they impact to you. So now we're in re reactive mode. So on the right hand side, we have controls in place to uh, mitigate the impact. So for example, if we have a a potential impact of a safety incident, and the only thing that's in line to prevent that from occurring is a cyber incident response plan, and that uh, plan has not been kept up with change management over the years and that plan um, has some gaps in it, hasn't been tested, then essentially that might be useless. So once, they, once the attack is, it occurs, there's nothing to keep them from uh, either uh, causing more damage or, or what have you. So another um, advantage of this bow tie is it's very visual. Uh, you, can, you can look at it and, and judge whether or not um, if you see some common controls uh, in, in a lot of different threat scenarios, like for example, physical security is showing up in, in all three threat scenarios, then that might help you prioritize. And that might uh, be a, uh, an example of uh, spending maybe more money on physical security to bolster the effectiveness of those controls. So next we have the cyber risk response. The most common area of weakness in this is uh, cyber um, communication. Uh, you know, the communication is required throughout the methodology. So some ways to Im improve communication would be to uh, document decision plans, document uh, responsibilities, have a feedback loop, uh, awareness, uh, perhaps look at external parties that you're gonna be interfacing. You know, other, other areas would be, uh, you know, common use of treatment would be things like accepting risks, um, mitigating risks, stopping, stopping the activity at all, uh, altogether if it's, it's, not, it's not worth the risk. Um, and of course, uh, clients uh, sometimes buy insurance to share that risk. Um, it's um, well known that a lot of uh, companies have um, Bitcoin's accounts ready so that uh, if they get attacked, uh, say a ransomware attack, they'll, they'll do their best to try to recover from backups and they'll, they'll try to restore. And then the last case scenario is if, if they can't restore, then they, they're forced to uh, pay on Bitcoin. So they'll have these, uh, these accounts ready. They don't normally like to publicize that. But um, the problems with Canadians though is we have uh, a tendency to pay. 
So as long as we keep on paying on uh, for cyber attack, uh, ransomware attacks, we're going to continue to be victims. So we're going to round out the uh, last slide with uh, monitoring the risk, and and we want to determine the the ongoing effectiveness of our risk responses. So here it's important to ensure that the, the changes to the business processes affecting risk are built into the organization, organization chain management process. And, and that'll affect uh, three different areas, uh, risk factor monitoring, risk management uh, process evaluation, and, and documentation. We wanna verify that the planned responses are actually uh, in line with uh, the cyber, cybersecurity requirements, uh, meet the business uh, organization needs, uh, legislation, directives, and regulations. All included in, in monitoring the risk and, and constantly approving, uh, because this is never going to be um, something that's static due to changing vulnerabilities and risk scenarios, threats. We want to make sure that our risk program is still as effective as always. Back to you, Sahar. Thanks very much, Paul and Jose, for this excellent presentation. I certainly learned a lot, and I hope our audience does as well. Um, so now we'll go to the Q&A part of our webinar. If you'd like to ask our speakers a question, please enter your question in the chat box on the left side of your screen. Uh, you can just click on the little bubble icon. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, in case there are additional questions that we can't get to in the next few minutes, uh, we will make sure to reply back to you by email after the webinar. So Paul and Jose, I already have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first question is, you mentioned a statistic that 74% of companies did not perform an OT risk assessment. Why do you think that number is so high? Um, I could take this. Uh, so my experience has shown that um, in, in the process industry, for example, uh, many companies are already identifying, evaluating, monitoring uh, process safety risks. Uh, they've been doing it for years. That is quite a mature uh, area. Uh, and that looks at things like overpressuring vessels, so looking at failure data on transmitters and valves, uh, things that can cause you know significant physical you know events like ex explosions. So this industry uh, is very uh, common. Uh, this is common in the chemical industry. Uh, very mature. Uh, they publish their data. They share their data with uh, many companies. Um, and, and they've developed these systems and layers of protection over the years, and, and it is quite a mature space. Um, and this is where I see OT cybersecurity risk, uh, where, where safe, process safety was 20 years ago. I see OT cybersecurity risk just starting out in, the, in that uh, equivalent area. So we're still maturing. Uh, we've got a lot of areas to go. Um, but we also see that a, a lot of operators, um, if you recall the statistic on the water treatment where their number one priority was, was ransomware, essentially a lot of these companies are getting bombarded with new events uh, on their IT infrastructure every day. So the o OT cybersecurity uh, threats have not really been uh, top of top of order. So I think as we see more of these attacks, like we have in uh, the, occurred in, in Florida at the water treatment uh, facility, or the uh, attack to the Ukraine power grid, I think we're going to see a uh, raise of awareness, and you know people are going to start to understand that OT uh, risk is also uh, a major problem. And I think this will likely, uh, eventually, uh, it'll make its way to uh, additional. Um, assessments uh, as, as being a priority for companies. And they're going to look more closely into their OT assets, especially if, if some of these attacks happen in North America. Um, imagine if the power were to be uh, shut down in, you know, in, in through minus 30 degree weather in the wintertime, like it could be uh, very devastating. So uh, hopefully we, we improve before we get to that, uh, that type of event. Back to you. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. So our next question is, our organization is relatively small and we don't have the budget or the resources to implement a major cybersecurity program. 
Um, this person is asking, are there other options? I can take that. So um, in this situation, actually we have come across with the, this challenge uh, quite often. So client, clients asking, you know, we're a small company, so we don't have that big budget to put together a, a cybersecurity program. Uh, so what we what we mentioned uh, is the same way with the methodology that we have put in place. So this is actually fit for purpose. So you can start small, um, and you can start identifying those areas that are actually the basics. So make sure you identify your, your most critical assets. Make sure you have uh, a cyber incident response plan in place that's built up uh, according to your your necessity and your maturity. And over time, you can start building up a, a cybersecurity program that will be more complete and, and more robust. So you can start with uh, at least the basics. And, and also, we have found some of the clients, uh, you know, they they want to start building a, a big cybersecurity program right away. And, and, and when you start, and you start by doing just an assessment and you identify they're, they're not doing even backups or, or, or things that they normally should be doing. So th those are, um, you know, basics that, uh, you know, doing your patches and stuff, but sometimes it's just doing it, doing it in a systematic way that will be, you know, covering uh, those, those real uh, critical assets that you have identified already. All right, awesome. Thanks, Jose. So another question we have is, what are some of the challenges you come across when working with companies when building an ICS cybersecurity risk management program? Okay, I'll take this. Um, you know, I would say it really depends on the on the industry, the client uh, that they that they're working in. You know, clients in um, in a regulated industry such as power industry, uh, where they have to follow uh, regulations like NARC SIP. They often face some challenges uh, just meeting the, the the design and the documentation process that's that's necessary. Uh, for example, they need to document um, the processes, and, and even before uh, documenting, they have to design processes on meeting their cybersecurity requirements. And and this can be a lot of process, a lot of paperwork. Most operators are focused on keeping the lights on. Uh, they don't really have available resources to to look at that detail, and and this is um, this can be uh, helped by automate automation. If you can automate some of the more repetitive tasks, that can help. Um, but another common issue with larger companies uh, developing either you know uh, compliance programs or or, or uh, cybersecurity programs, uh, they don't always work as one. They sometimes work in silos. And this isn't a great approach because you you tend to have inconsistencies between business units. You might be gathering your evidence uh, slightly in a, in a different way, and and it, it creates a lot of problems later when uh, when it comes to audits. Um, however, si smaller companies have some unique challenges in that uh, often they have uh, resource constraints. They don't have people that are uh, educated or trained in, in cybersecurity. I, I was at a, a tabletop exercise a few years ago, and I was talking to a very experienced automation person, and he had indicated to me that he, he really didn't have uh, the, you know, the experience to even identify and clean a virus. So in, in those cases, a lot of those companies, any, anyways, they just want to, you know, restore from um, an image and get the plant up and running. They're not really interested in forensics. So, uh, you know, for those companies just starting out, I, developing a cybersecurity program, I would recommend that you lean on your IT resources uh, for assistance if you're not experienced in, in that area. And you want to focus on backups and recovery first. And make sure you have a solid incident response plan. Um, and as your, your program matures over the years and you have more budget available, you could start building up on the plan. So it's, it's important to start with something. Uh, it doesn't have to be too extensive, but it should be uh, something that you're, you're not totally caught off guard if, uh, if you're hit with one of these um, cyber attacks. Thanks. Right. Okay, perfect. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So... This one is actually more of a comment. Um, this individual mentioned, I don't believe that we are at risk of a cyber attack to our operational assets. We are not connected to the internet. So, 
So this is an interesting comment. Um, what do you think? Do operations that are not connected to the internet need to worry about cyber attacks? Okay, okay I can take that. So um, we hear that a lot. Uh, you might indeed be safe from many cyber attacks, um, but uh, the reality is without performing a proper systematic risk assessment of your operations, so you won't be able to determine uh, where you are, uh, you know, in related to cyber risk uh, for your ICS operations. So uh, good examples are even in systems that are not connected to the internet. So you could have uh, malware introduced to your system through USB sticks. Um, if you don't have, you know, the correct policies in place and people are not following those processes and procedures, so that may happen. Uh, another thing you have to also realize that um, more and more um, so business need to be competitive and then they're requiring, you know, that interconnection between the business side and also the operation side of that on, of an organization. So that communication is happening and sometimes you not even know that uh, that's happening. So, you know, so you have to you have to do uh, assessments of your operations, even if you're not connected, and you're going to start looking into different areas. As we mentioned before, maybe um, it's not a you know, rock recovery plan that's not in place uh, the way it should be, or, or even you're not um, doing your tabletop exercises in a systematic way. So the one thing is to have a, a response plan in place. Uh, that's written, but nobody knows where it is, and nobody knows exactly what to do because it's not being actually practiced uh, in a, in, in very often. So those those are items that will be revealed when you're doing an assessment. So uh, and so you don't you you don't have to um, you know have a very soft, sophisticated uh, technology system. So there are things uh, very basic, but uh, it, it will provide you with a. Uh, uh, a good protection when things will happen if if, if that happen to to your organization. All right. Well, thanks very much. Um, well, that's all the time we have. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again for this great presentation, and I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. Um, if we did not get a chance to answer your question, we will do so by email within the next day or two. You can also get in touch with our presenters directly through the uh, contact details shown on this slide. Or you can also email us at marketing at bba.ca if you have any additional questions or comments. So thanks very much for joining us today. Bye for now. Bye now.